Hello and welcome to the course. I'm your host today, Lee, and I'm speaking with Associate Professor of Behavioral Science and Economics, Alex Emos from the Booth School of Business. Professor Emos teaches negotiations and behavioral economics, and his research spans a variety of topics across economics and psychology. Professor Emos is here to talk about his career path and how he became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Alex Emus. It's a joy to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here and uh, to chat with you today. So this is a big question, but can you give us a general overview of your career path from your time in undergrad to becoming an academic at the University of Chicago? Sure. I'd say it's very nonlinear is how I would describe it. So I, I came to America from Moldova where I grew up as a kid. And I didn't really know, I wasn't really thinking about career or what I wanted to do for a long, long time, including basically until the end of high school. I kind of thought vaguely, I I liked physics, so that's what I came in majoring to college with. Uh, But in college, I didn't really think about my career or what I wanted to major in or things like that for a while either. I kind of was undeclared for a while. And at some point, because I am a child of immigrants, my parents kept saying, you have to be a medical doctor. You have to be a medical doctor because all their friends had kids who were medical doctors. So I was pre-med for mo- for essentially the entire time I was in college. At the same time, I was really, I became really interested in economics. So I took it as a double major and was really into kind of the classes I was taking and things like that. And by the time I was getting ready to graduate, I still wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I had taken the MCATs. I was about to start applying to medical school, but then I was just kind of having second thoughts. And I was start, I was playing music a lot of the time. So I just decided, you know what, I'm going to take some more time to think about it. And instead of going to medical school and applying to medical school, I moved to New York and tried to pursue music for, for a little bit uh, as a potential career path while working other jobs. I actually worked in a in a corneal fibrosis lab dissecting corneas for for the majority of my first year. And during that year, I also, uh, I was working two jobs in order to kind of make ends meet. If people know about the rental market in New York, it's it's very expensive to rent the closet that I was, that I was, that I was living in at the time. So I had two jobs. And my second job actually introduced me to somebody, to kind of a vice president of a tech company in Wall Street. uh, And we started chatting here and there. And we actually ended up starting a company. We, we had a startup using some of the stuff that I was working on as an undergrad in order to develop intellectual property for using EEG, namely brainwaves, as a biometric identicator, almost like a fingerprint scanner. So we started this, uh, this company, got first round funding. So I was working at this company for a while. And in the meantime, I was kind of still thinking about, do I want to go to medical school? I ended up applying to medical school. And in the middle of the application process, as I was kind of getting into schools, I found behavioral economics, which is what I do now. It was an NPR radio interview uh, with somebody who kind of started talking about behavioral economics in the background as, as a topic that they were interested in. And I had no idea this even existed. I was really interested in economics, but I kind of felt like the human side was missing. I was also taking a lot of psych classes at the same time as an undergrad. And I thought this combination of psychology and economics was just absolutely perfect for me. So I just emailed all my, uh, all my professors in, in undergrad and said, hey, I think I might want to do this. What do I do with this? I didn't, I didn't know what academia was. I didn't know what a professor did. I didn't know about journal publishing. I didn't know about any of this stuff. So my dad's a construction worker. My my mom is an accountant. I, I had kind of no role model in this, but I thought it'd be interesting to kind of read economics all day or think about behavioral economics. So I applied to graduate school and uh, I happened to get you know rejected absolutely everywhere because I was completely underprepared, except for UC San Diego. UC San Diego, I think, took a big chance on me. And I got into UC San Diego and I got into a bunch of medical schools. And for like four or five months, I was just sitting there looking at these, I guess it was less than four or five months, maybe it was a couple of months, but I was just kind of deciding between medical school or an econ PhD program. And at the end of the day, I was just reading these research papers in economics. And this is really what motivated me. And I thought that this was, this is what I wanted to do. And so I decided to pull the trigger and, uh, and accept the, uh, the program to go to UC San Diego. And I entered graduate school, 
as I had imagined, I was completely underprepared, but I took the first year to really focus on the classes and try to kind of take calculus and things like that on the side because the last math class I took was six years earlier and it was linear algebra. I hadn't taken all of these advanced mathematics classes that everybody else in the program had taken. So I was kind of struggling a lot my first and, first and second year trying to get through the coursework. I found out through graduate school that a professor was actually doing research for a long for the majority of, of their time, which was super exciting to me. And the teaching was really, really fun as well. So I was a TA for a while. I got really into that. I'm still really into teaching. Um, so I, as I was in graduate school, I realized that, hey, I, I actually kind of hit the jackpot. This is, this is the perfect thing for me. I don't need to kind of think about what else I want to do. And I became really passionate about that. And, you know, it, it, it happened to be that I ended up uh, with, uh, at the end of my third or uh, at, the, at the end of my third year, I ended up meeting somebody, George Lowenstein, who became one of my mentors. I ended up giving a talk at Carnegie Mellon as a fourth year, and they invited me out for, for a postdoc. And I ended up leaving after four years, joining Carnegie Mellon as a postdoc, and ended up starting there as a, uh, as a tenure track assistant professor in 2014. And Carnegie Mellon was just an absolutely wonderful place to be as a behavioral economist. I got, I had great mentorship. I had excellent students. Uh, and after six years, I, I, I got this opportunity to give a talk at the University of Chicago at the Booth School of Business. I ended up getting an offer from them. And, and now I'm here and I'm super excited to be here because I'm from Chicago. I grew up in Chicago after moving from Moldova. My parents are here. So it's just overall just a really, really wonderful place to be. What a wide ranging career you've had from, you know, your college days all the way up until now. I'm curious how you would explain behavioral economics to someone who has no idea what it is and did not listen to that NPR interview. Behavioral economics is, is, is really interesting because Economics is the study of human decision making under constraints. So it's somebody trying to make decisions uh, out there in the world while having things like a budget constraint. They don't have an infinite amount of money to spend on things. So they they buy food, they pay rent, they invest in stocks and all of these sorts of things under this constraint that they don't have an infinite amount of resources. And essentially what economics does is to try to model that decision making, this sort of consumption decision the investing decision and things like that using mathematical models. And this has been done since kind of the early 1900s to use heavy, mach heavy mathematical machinery to try to better understand human decision-making and try to scale up from kind of these individual trying to make decisions to a group of individuals making decisions, to a market making decisions, all the way up to the macro economy, thinking about things like GDP and unemployment. But ultimately, it really starts with human decision making. But for a long time, this assumption in economics about what is human decision making has been one of a fully rational individual who kind of under, fully understands the situation around them and makes quote unquote correct decisions given the information that they have. So they, if they don't want to eat a chocolate cake that's in front of them because they want to lose weight, they don't eat that chocolate cake. If they want to go to the gym in order to lose weight, they go to the gym. They don't, for example, buy a gym membership and then just never go. That's not something that, that people do in these models. And so what behavioral economics does is to say, look, we have this wonderful tool in economics in order to, to try to understand human decision-making but it's missing something. It's missing the psychology of how people actually make decisions. So people are impulsive. People take on either too little risk when they're scared, or they take on too much risk when they're worried about, for example, losing out on something. So in the stock market, for example, I study behavioral finance. And in behavioral finance, you have this, you have this phenomenon called the disposition effect. When somebody buys a stock and the price of the stock goes down, they're really, really reluctant to sell it. They hold on to it for way too long because they don't want to admit to themselves that, look, I made a loss and I need to get rid of it in order to buy something new. And this disposition effect is costly for people, but it's also outside of the sort of standard economic framework. So what behavioral economics does is essentially take psychology and to incorporate some of this, these psychological concepts about real life decision making into economic models to make them better, to allow them to... Uh, have greater predictive power in terms of trying to say, look, we see this out in the real world. Tax rates are going to go up. 
or we're facing a recession or something like that, can we as economists make better predictions about, about what those outcomes are going to lead to in terms of the economy, in terms of individual decision making? So that's kind of behavioral economics in a nutshell. And I obviously study kind of specific facets of that field since it's so broad. That's a fascinating explanation of behavioral economics. I wonder, though, what were you like as a kid and a student, specifically during your middle and high school years? I was just really curious, I would say. I tried to read a lot about a whole bunch of different topics. So I was really into fiction. I was really into movies and I painted a lot as a kid. I, I, I don't really know how to describe myself other than that aspect of curiosity. I was trying to figure out how the world works. I was trying to read some philosophy and things like that. I wasn't particularly thinking about what I wanted to do is when I grow up with all of this type of stuff. But I was just really, really kind of fascinated with the world is how I would describe myself. I was also trying to fit in a lot because again, I was, I did come from, from Moldova when I was nine years old. So I was trying to learn the language for a while. Uh, I was trying to make friends. In the beginning, I kind of only had friends who spoke my the same language as me because I just couldn't communicate with Americans and people who spoke English. But after a while, I, I became friends with more people who uh, were born here, who came came here when they were younger. Uh, so I was trying to do a lot of that as well. Um, but that that's kind of kind of that in a nutshell. And I know you've gone on to this medical path, but I wonder when you look back on who you were then as a adolescent, if there's anything that just makes sense for why you are where you are today. I'm sure you didn't know what behavioral economics was then, but can you look back at your younger self and see, well, it makes sense that this is where I ended up? Yeah, I think it absolutely makes sense about, about where I ended up, just because the sort of thing that motivates me in research that kind of gets me fired up and passionate about my job, which I, which I definitely am, is the fact that every single day I can kind of get to wake up and think about what's interesting out there. Can I think harder about it? Can I try to figure it out? And that sort of thing is what motivated me a lot when I was younger as well, obviously in very different ways, but it was it's the same impulse. It's the same drive of going out there and trying to figure something out. And the fact that I can get paid to do this and I'm surrounded by people who are who are also passionate about the same thing. It's just just an absolute gift, I would say. And I, if I was to tell my 13 year old self that this is what I would do for a living, I'm I'm sure they would be really really excited for me as well. And that's a glowing review of your job. But I also know that pursuing academia, even just pursuing a higher degree, like a PhD can be a grueling process and can take a lot of energy. There's a lot of emotional labor going on. Who supported you through this process? I had an excellent support network. Um, my parents, first and foremost, um, I'm a war refugee. So when I came from Moldova, it was because there was a civil war that broke out there. And I kind of tell this to people and they think, wow, you must be, have been really affected by that. And I, and I, 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 I was, of course, but at the same time, my parents were just so supportive of me at every single instance of my life when I, as, as far back as, you know, kind of shielding me from the worst things during the war, all the way through kind of on undergraduate and high school and middle school, when I decided to say, hey, I'm not going to medical school, I'm going to move to New York and, you know, play the guitar. A lot of parents would say, hey, that's crazy. No, there's no way you're doing it. And my parents, you know, they did say that, but, but only for, for a few minutes. And then the conversation turned to how are we going to support you in this decision? They came out to New York and helped me find an apartment and, you know, were kind of always there for me. And again, my parents, my parents didn't really know about a lot of the types of things that, that happened in this country. My dad, again, was a construction worker and my mom was an accountant. So it's not like they they knew the lay of the land. They were they, they were just there to support me, and and I'm just kind of internally grateful for that. And obviously, they were very supportive of me getting the PhD and pursuing academia. On top of that, I've had kind of really great mentorship. So, uh, Ori Gnizi was my advisor in undergrad, uh, sorry, in graduate school. When I first got to UC San Diego, 
I was very underprepared, but at the same time, he really kind of took a chance on me from the very, very beginning. He started talking to me about research and that sort of spark the fact that at the end of the line, after all of this difficult coursework and all, after that, I get to do research with him. And he was very supportive about that. The entire process really kept me going through sort of tough times. Um, and he was, he was just an excellent mentor. And once I left graduate school, George Lowenstein and Linda Babcock at Carnegie Mellon, amongst the other faculty there, were just just excellent. We're just an excellent support network. As far as both mentoring me in the research process and the teaching process, navigating everything, but also serving as just really good role models for how full your life can be as a researcher in terms of the sort of interesting questions you can pursue, as well as the other types of things that you could be doing in your, in, in your life, in your career. So I've just had incredible, incredible mentors. And I do still at the University of Chicago as well. So behavioral economics is a broad umbrella that encompasses a lot of things. How did you decide to specialize in whatever you're specializing in? So I'd love a brief description of that and why it was that particular niche that you wanted to dive into. So I kind of always wanted to do behavioral economics once I found out that I wanted to go to graduate school. I, I, I did a lot of psychology classes as an undergraduate I did a bit of neuroscience. So when I heard about behavioral economics, that's what motivated me to go to graduate school in the first place, this idea that I can take my interest in psychology and incorporate that into my interests in economics. Once I got to graduate school, what I became really interested in is the very, very basic individual decision-making. So for example, whether how much risk a person is willing to take on, or when they're buying an asset and they buy, an, they buy a stock and that stock goes down in price. And they're thinking about, do I put more money into this? Do I buy a riskier asset or do I sell and just you know kind of stay away from risk for a while? This sort of basic decision is fully modeled in the standard economic framework, but that's not how people behave. For example, what I found out early in my research is the fact that if I, if I buy a stock, price of the stock goes down, I'm actually motivated to take on more risk in order to recover from that loss, but only if I haven't sold that stock yet. If that stock is sold, namely if the loss is realized, people do the exact opposite. They actually start staying away from risk. And this was one of my first papers. Uh, this was actually my job market paper, making that distinction between realized or paper losses, losses that are just on paper versus losses that you've already experienced and you've already sold the asset. So that kind of started me on a path of looking at how basic aspects of our environment affect our decision-making. And that, that kind of translated to my recent work on how for example, how beliefs are formed about, about, again, assets or things like real estate as a function of whether you own something or you don't. So for example, one of my more recent papers found that if you own something and you learn something about it, you overreact to that information. If it's good news, you, became, you become super optimistic. If it's bad news, you become super pessimistic relative to viewing the exact same information about something that you don't know. At the same time, my other line of research is incorporating behavioral economics into discrimination. So this is research that I started with, uh, with Aislinn Boren uh, back in 2015 or 2016. We started looking at the literature. And again, there's a, law, there's a large literature in the social sciences, particularly in sociology and economics, on discrimination, on what are the sources of discrimination, whether they're people just not liking members of the other group, or whether it's not about liking or not liking, it's more that they're not really sure about what the product is or what the other people are doing. And they have some sort of beliefs that members of that group are, have a lower ability to produce a high quality product. So those are kind of the broad strokes overview of the two different models of how economists think about discrimination. And what we did is to start thinking about, all right, maybe the people's beliefs aren't Correct. Maybe they're making mistakes when they're making these decisions when evaluating others. So part of my, my, my kind of second broad area of research is incorporating behavioral economics into how economists think about discrimination. Wow, that's fascinating. As a professor, what's the most enjoyable part of your job? I find two aspects of the job really enjoyable. I think, obviously, the research generation process of thinking about research ideas 
and pursuing them and reading the papers and running the experiments and talking to collaborators is incredibly enjoyable, just an absolute joy. But at the same time, I really also love teaching. So being in the classroom and talking to students and uh, hearing them connect with the material that I've developed for the course, hearing their feedback of how the, uh, the course has affected their lives, like the internships that they get, or potentially even the major that they choose has just been incredibly rewarding as well. So I, 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 I'm, I, I get a lot of pleasure from both of those aspects of the job. Well, on the flip side of the coin, what is your least favorite part or parts of this job? That's a tougher question. I really like the job. Or phrased another way, what are the things that you find challenging about the job? I think, I think probably the most challenging part is the revision process of papers. So for example, once you write a paper and you're really excited about it, you send it into a journal and think, and you're kind of expecting them to make a decision whether to publish it or not. But what happens first before they make that decision is they tell you to revise the paper according to a long, long list of comments that they have for you. And that process of kind of rewriting your paper, which can sometimes take a year or more, is pretty challenging as far as like kind of trying to get into uh, get into the head of the person asking these questions, whether you're doing a good job, whether you're sufficiently addressing these these sorts of comments. That's probably the most challenging part of the job. But at the same time, it could also be really rewarding because some of those comments are great. A lot of those comments are great and do make the paper better. That's probably the most challenging part of the job for me. And what would your advice be to someone who is interested in pursuing academia and maybe specifically following a similar path to yours? I'd say there's there's kind of two pieces of advice. I would say take classes seriously in your PhD and just try try to get a very, very good foundation, get get a good base from which to do your research, because that just pays so much so many dividends later on as far as kind of the tools you have for the research. The second piece of advice I would say is to particularly to do something interdisciplinary sort of in, in the way that I'm that I'm working in is to just read pretty broadly, not just kind of focus on reading papers in your own field. And something that's worked for me is to be it is to continuously try to be excited about the types of things that you're working on. And what I've found that's worked again for me, this is I'm not sure how much how good of advice this is, is to pursue topics that are sometimes close together, but always, but, but also a little, a little left field. So there's, there's this really great quote that I like from Tom Waits, who's a musician that I really admire when talking about how he, uh, how he writes music. He talks about his hands like dogs where they'd like to go to happy places and they get very, very used to routines. So he says that he continuously tries to learn new instruments to continue being excited about music. And that's kind of the, philosophy that I have for my own research is to kind of read broadly. And if I'm doing something like individual decision-making and risk-taking or something like that for a long time, I'm thinking, well, maybe I want to start thinking about how people make beliefs about, about particular decisions or start thinking about housing or something like that, start reading in that area. And that's, that's, that's kept things really, really exciting for me as I, again, I'm pretty early in my career still, so I don't know what's going to happen in 10 years but it's, it's worked for me so far. You mentioned earlier that you and your family are, are war refugees, and you talked about navigating that transition from Moldova to America. And I wonder if you think that having had to navigate that transition and have that as part of your identity, whether that gives you a unique perspective as an academic and maybe as a behavioral economist. I think I think it does in some ways. I'm not I'm not quite I wouldn't be able to say exactly how, but it certainly made me a lot more grateful about a lot of the sort of things that I'm that I that I get to do just because of uh, the things that I've seen uh, coming up. And that sort of gratitude has made me really excited about the types of things that I get to do on an everyday basis. And I think that kind of feeds into my research as far as uh, the sort of pa- the, the sort of kind of everyday feelings that I have about it. Other than that, I think it's it's allowed me to keep uh, an open mind, uh, given that I did take a relatively nonlinear path to where I am, as far as the sort of things that I'm reading, the sort of things that I want to read, and the sort of research that uh, that I both produce and consume. So those are probably the two the two main things uh, that 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 my upbringing has has brought into my current life as an academic. And 
looking ahead, what's something that you aspire to do? I aspire to have an impact in the world. I think that most academics would answer this question similarly, is that the most exciting part about kind of getting your research out there is to see a citation or to see a paper that follows up on your work. To me, that's just, that never gets old, that feeling of seeing a conference presentation and seeing a paper that you've written on somebody else's slide. That just kind of means that somebody else has read it, internalized it, and has been, has been doing something with it. So on the longer term, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to have an impact as far as kind of my my uh, my research affecting policy and affecting people's decisions and potentially improving people's lives. Just this is kind of bro- very broad strokes, but this is something that I think about quite often. And in the current context that you're in, what do you find most fulfilling about being an academic, being a professor, being at the University of Chicago? Particularly being at the University of Chicago, I'd say, is just being surrounded by so many passionate, interesting people from so many different walks of life doing incredibly exciting research. So it's just so energizing to go into the office and to run into people in the hallway and, you know, kind of hear about the next thing that they're working on or to chat about your research idea or to present to your colleagues and get their feedback. That's just, it's a gift to be, to be in that sort of environment. I've been speaking with Associate Professor Alex Emos. Professor, thank you for your time. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Thanks for listening.